it's my great privilege, and I think most of you um, either have the brochure or saw the brochure coming in, and it's my great privilege to introduce um, one of the most prominent, preeminent uh, trauma surgeons in our country, one of the first women leaders in uh, trauma surgery and in surgery in general. Uh, Peggy Knudsen, as you know, uh, from is a native of the Midwest, did most of her training at the University of Michigan, then initially was on the faculty at Stanford. I was chided yesterday by Dr. Mel uh, for not inviting him to dinner. He said, how did you not know I knew Peggy? I'm like, come on. <laughs> You've only been here three months. I don't know everything about you quite yet. <laughs> um, but I had the privilege of knowing uh, Dr. Knudsen when I was an intern and at San Francisco General. We had the first uh, all-female trauma team in San Francisco General, and the saying at the time was, if you were somebody in San Francisco, you couldn't find a man to save your life. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a great, um, amazing experience. We've been uh, friends and colleagues ever since. Uh, Dr. Knudsen has, as you have seen, has had a distinguished career in trauma, and most recently, in addition to the amazing academic work she has done, the contributions that she's made to changing the field, which in fact is really the goal of any true academic surgeon, is that the observations you make in the clinic that you then go and test in some other way become the life-altering things that change the way we practice uh, for patients in the future. There's really no greater contribution. She Then you would think that that would be enough uh, for any full career has gone on to make a big contribution to the uh, role of our military surgeons and how they stay ready for the future. So she has lots of, uh, lots of reasons to have tight connections here with UC Davis. And we are thrilled, Peggy, to have you here talking about one of your many contributions to the field. Well, good morning, everybody. I don't think I can follow Missy. That was quite a presentation. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I thank Diana for the um, opportunity to come and visit you here. Diana and I work closely together at the college uh, where I do the work that I'm doing with the military. I want to uh, take an opportunity to thank all of you who are in uniform or have worn the uniform. We thank you for your service. I'm not in the military, and I never was, but um, we certainly appreciate all you all that you do. I also want to take an opportunity to thank the trauma team here because some of you may know you're taking care of a person who works in my department at San Francisco General who was severely injured and was flown here to UC Davis. Um, we're going to go visit her later, but thank you all for, for what you've done to, to make sure that she was well cared for and she really appreciates uh, what you've done. Um, this is a look back at something that I've been passionate about since I was a very young trauma surgeon with Matt uh, down at Stanford. Um, Sometimes, for those of you who are just starting your residency, wondering what, what would you will do to research, sometimes your patients tell you um, what you should be researching. And I was, uh, I think, my first year at Stanford, and I had a patient who was a, um, a professor at one of our local universities. And he was in a, in a car crash. And he had actually ruptured his diaphragm. His liver was in his chest. Um, he was very ill, and we were so proud of ourselves that we operated on him, saved him, fixed his liver, finally got him off the ventilator, and he stood up and he died. And he had a massive pulmonary embolism right in front of us. And we were devastated. And um, a, f a few weeks after that, there was a young girl who was in a car crash, multiple uh, orthopedic injuries and kept uh, every day was a little more short of breath, another shower of pulmonary emboli, and um, luckily she didn't die. We rescued her, but I went to the literature then, and I said, what do you do for trauma? You know, how do you prevent these things from happening? And there was one paper from NIH that said, trauma patients are at high risk, no, nothing about what to do with them. Um, so this became my passion over the years, and I'm going to share with you sort of my life history of, of, in, of researching this uh, with the idea that we actually now 
have something going on that I think may make a difference. Um, so I need to advance the, there we go, sorry, sorry. Let me go back one. Um, I'll, the, uh, my disclosure is that I am now funded by the Department of Defense for some of this um, that you're going to hear about. So this, this talk could be called um, An Old Lady Who Looks Back 30 Years, because this research, as I said, began when, uh, in 1988 when I was a, a fresh young trauma surgeon at Stanford. In our initial study, I'm not, they're not, there we go. In our initial study, we um, looked at a, a series of 113 patients at Stanford. Uh, we had serial, uh, we walked around with the duplex uh, ultrasound <coughs> exam. Now, I will tell you that we didn't even have color in those days. And the duplex machine looked like a television. And uh, we couldn't really, I couldn't really read them myself because they weren't digital even then. So they were really difficult. It was mainly like looking at your television screen when it's not working. Um, but I had a technician who knew what she was doing. And we, we went around and we scanned all these people uh, with their ultrasound machine. All the patients had been receiving prophylaxis. Um, and we found that our overall VTE rate among these 113 patients was 10%, which is, you might say, fairly high. Remember that we have a surveillance bias, right? Because we're looking for these. They're not necessarily clinically significant. And we had a PE rate of 6%. Luckily, no further deaths in this series, but a very high rate. And the PEs, of course, are not surveyed, right? Those are symptomatic. Um, and we had patients who were receiving low-dose heparin. So that's the 5,000 units that you probably use here and a subcuticular dose. Um, and we had SCDs, or the sequential compression devices, and they, they basically looked the same. In other words, the rate of VTE was the same in, in each group. So you could say either they were equally effective or neither one of them was effective. So we, we looked at what are the risk factors um, for getting a VTE after trauma, <coughs> and we found that cer certainly the older you were, the more likely you were to get it. The number of days that you were immobilized was, was a significant number. If you hadn't uh, been transfused, a number of uh, red cells, and we thought, well, maybe we altered the coagulation system by giving them a transfusion, but in my mind, actually, probably the number of red cells you received is just a reflection of how severely injured you are. And this last thing really sort of surprised me. And I said, well, why would somebody who comes in anticoagulated not be protected? from getting a future uh, VTE, and that made no sense to me. But you know, when you, when you turn your data over to a statistician, you gotta like, you gotta go with it, right? You can't like alter it. So this is, we published this, and I think if you remember this slide, I'm gonna show you in my very last part of this talk why this is actually very significant. So um, I went up then from um, Stanford up to UCSF, uh, was offered a, really excellent job by Dr. Frank Lewis right after Dr. Trunke left there. And I went up with my ultrasound machine and a little bit of seed money, and I said, I'm gonna sh we're going to do this study. And they said, you know, I'm going to show you about VTE and all this. And, and they said to me, we don't have that here. I go, so I just moved 40 miles, and somehow D VTE went away. And they said, well, we don't, really, we don't really look for it, and we don't actually have any protocols to protect these people. And I said, well, great, because then I can have a real controlled study. So we once again randomized 251 patients. I now had a color flow duplex. We could actually had a nice machine. But Dr. Farmer probably remembers that when I first went up there with an ultrasound machine, every time I took it out of my office, I got reported because of the, 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 um, the radiology said surgeons shouldn't be doing ultrasounds. <laughs> now that's changed, as you know. So we had patients that got low dose heparin, we got patients that had sequential compression <coughs> devices, and we had some controls that got neither. Uh, we, all, we did, in fact, find some DVT, despite the fact that San Francisco said they didn't have it. So we had a 6% rate of DVT. We had two PEs, but half of those people died. SCD was only effective in TBI patients. So you might just say, well, they're the only people that can't get out of them, right? I mean, you know, you're in a coma, it's hard to take those boots off. Um, low dose heparin did not, was not any better than controls. So it, it basically, it didn't work. So then there's this new drug called the noxaparin, 
and uh, San Francisco General, which is now the Zuckerberg Hospital. So all of you on Facebook, we thank you for paying for our new hospital. Um, Anoxaparin was a brand new drug, had been used in Europe for a long time. We were the first <coughs> trauma center in the United States to have anoxaparin. Um, and we sold it to our hospital because we didn't have to monitor an oxyparin. So it was, it was actually a way to get it in the hospital. At the same time, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Bill Gertz up in Canada also had an oxyparin. And he was looking at the difference in DVT prevention in trauma patients between low-dose heparin, the standard dirty heparin as we call it, very large molecule, versus the low molecular weight heparin. And he was using venography. Now, I don't know how your patients, but I can't imagine a lot of trauma patients will consent to a venogram, uh, but he was able to do it, and he showed that, l that low molecular weight heparin was much more effective than standard heparin uh, given subcutaneously. We um, used ultrasound instead, and we compared mechanical uh, with the low molecular weight heparin. And once again, we found that, it, that low molecular weight heparin was much better than anything that we had been using. And we really reduced our duplex DVT rate to less than 1%. Remember, we were going around scanning all these people every week, really looking for DVT. Again, a surveillance bias, but what you need to do if you're doing research. So we published ours at the same time. His got in the New England Journal. My, mine went into Journal of Trauma. Nevertheless, um, we were both very, um, we were both very pleased that we had found something we thought that was going to work. The interesting thing is he called me, and I didn't know Dr. Gertz. He's actually a hematologist. And he said, you know, Dr. Knudsen, I read your paper, but you know, you made a mistake. I said, oh, I did? Oh, my god, what? He said, well, you told, you put the, how much an oxyparin costs. I said, yes. And he said, well, that's three times as much as it really costs. And I said, you're in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it costs here. <clears throat> so. Um, you know, all of these studies were small, as you'll notice. So those of you that are researchers, you notice it takes a long time to get patients enrolled in clinical research. And I would submit that clinical research is much harder to do than laboratory research because patients are also varied, and particularly in trauma. You know, a head injury here is different than a head injury there, and then there's a fracture on top of that. So clinical research, if you're going to do it, is very hard to do. Patients are, not, are difficult to randomize. Um, so sometimes it's good to go to a, to a big database to kind of help you out with the epidemiology, not for research. These, these databases are not really made for research, but they can give you a flavor of something that maybe you should be looking at. So uh, the, the Committee on Trauma has, and um, many of you are on the Committee on Trauma, um, has a national database that all of you are required to contribute to if you're a level one or level two trauma center. So we went back and looked at some of the data that was in the NTDB, recognizing that it's not, it wouldn't be as complete a database as, as we could get for DVT and PE, but it gave us some ideas. So we found at that time there was about a half a million people that were in the uh, NTDB. Most of them were blunt injuries. Most of them were not severely injured. Uh, only 30% of them had an ISS greater than 10. About 1,000 patients had a DVT, so the rate was about 0.36%. 500 of them had a pulmonary embolism, and only 82 patients were reported as having both. But the PE mortality rate was still fairly significant. So when, when you've got a big, big database like this, you can go in and do some fancy, uh, really some fancy statistics. And we found out that shock on admission, so if your blood pressure was less than 90 when you were admitted with trauma, you had a two times the odds ratio of getting a DVT or PE. If your age was greater than 40, um, you, you, your rate goes up. If you had a severe head injury, as we know, that's a, that's a really good risk factor. A pelvic fracture, your rate's getting higher and higher. Lower extremity fracture, as we know, um, is also a contributor. And, and of course, if you're paralyzed and you can't uh, you're in the lower extremities, especially, you can't um, you can't really get your your pump back in your in your veins and your leg, and so you're really at high risk. If, if you had any type of surgery, and I call this one op, what, an operation that was an hour, uh, you're, you're four times the risk of getting a DVT or PE. And if you have a venous injury, by definition, you have a DVT already, right? And then if you're merely on a ventilator. For more than three days, you have 10 times the, the rate of getting a PTE. 
So when you, when, you, when you can do multivariate, some of these things held up, and we're just going to go through this quickly. Um, again, venous injury is a huge risk factor, but the ventilator days, in other words, the sicker you are, the more likely you are to get a VTE. Although, I'm going to tell you that um, there are some other things going along, going along with this ventilator, and I'll show you. So, you know, you all know Virtue's triangle, so I, I made my own triangle. I said, if you have, you know, so stasis was Virchow's triangle, hypercoagulability and endothelial damage. And I said, well, in trauma, if you're paralyzed or you're immobilized, um, you have stasis. If you have multiple transfusions or severe injuries, you can, be, you can develop this hypercoagulable state. And if you have a fracture or a venous uh, trauma, then you have endothelial damage. So it fits that trauma patients would be at high risk. So this is the algorithm that I, we proposed in the annals that we wrote, and this is actually one we still use. So you have an injured patient, and you said, well, if you, you had one of those odds ratios be, that I showed you between two and three, you're at high risk, and these are the risk factors that you've already heard. And then you ask, can the patient get some heparin, or can the patient have any type of anticoagulant? And, and if there's no contraindication, then we use low molecular weight heparin, the prophylactics dose, twice a, twice a day. If you can't get heparin and you're in that group, then mechanical compression is probably okay for you. But if you go over here and you have one of those higher risk factors where your odds ratio is between 4 and 10, and these are the factors I'm just reminding you, once again, you have to say, is there a counterindication to, to heparin? And if there isn't, then we actually would recommend you have the combination of low molecular weight heparin and mechanical compression, recognizing there is no data to support this, <coughs> zero data to support this. And if you have a counterindication to heparin and, you, and you're in a high risk factor, you're sort of screwed here. This is, this is the, these are the worst patients. That you, so you can put in a filter, and I will talk a little bit about IVC filters, or you can follow these patients carefully uh, with surveillance duplex. And this is what we recommend and, and pretty much what we follow. So what about CABA filters? Well, when I went into the NTDV, I kept finding this thing that was called an IVC plication. So you might know, remember what an IVC plication is. Um, I sort of remember it. I have to say, you, you went to the school at University of Dayton, right? So did I hear that? That's, I actually was a flyer too. I went to undergraduate there and played basketball for the women. Flyers team. Um, an IVC plication is like a barrette. And um, I, I can remember seeing it maybe once when I was a medical student. So when you went in to do a, a, a um, colon reception or something high risk, there was an external thing that you put over the, the vena cava to, so that you wouldn't get clot going, during the operation. Uh, it was called an IVC plication. I, I looked at this and there was like 3,000 patients in there that had a plication? Like, what is this craziness? Who's doing that? Well, then we found out that the same, that the same um, code was used for a filter. So there were 4,000 patients in the NTDB that had had a filter. Interesting thing is, 86% of them had no VTE. So these were prophylactic vena cable filters, which were being placed by groups. Um, the PE rate in the filter group was high. Unfortunately, we couldn't tell whether they got the filter because they had the PE or they got it as, as uh, afterwards, but still most of them had no, um, no VTE and 400 of them didn't have even one of my risk factors that I, um, that I showed you. So we thought there was a little bit of, of, uh, of filter fever going on here. And in fact, most of these at the time were the permanent filters. It was before the removable filters. So there was a lot of trauma patients walking around out there with the permanent filter. So indeed, we thought there was a lot of filter fever happening. Um, and it turns out that um, the problems with the filters are that the recurrence with PE, even with the filter, is still pretty high. Because uh, they, they can tilt, um, they can move. And actually, they don't protect you against DVT. In fact, they, they actually promote DVT because they slow down the flow in the vena cava. 10% of people that have a fil filter will have some degree of cable thrombosis, which is bad. Many of them have permanent leg edema because we put these filters in them. And some of them migrate. And in fact, we've had one that you can see in the picture here where the, where the little struts came out uh, in a perforated the IVC. 
um, we don't know what to do with this. We just left it. <laughs> it was like, well, we're not going to go. You can't get it out when it's stuck like that. Um, and the timing is important. And I think that one of the important first papers that it talked about timing was uh, a guy by the name of, of uh, Owens who was here, I believe, when he did when he published that. And it should six percent of patients that with trauma that have a PE have it within 24 hours of injury. So you got to put these filters in before they get injured. I mean, is you know really if you're going to actually be effective. So maybe I'm showing my bias that I don't really like filters, but maybe that's coming through. And then there was the retrievable filters. We thought this is the answer, right? We can put them in and we can take them out and we can protect our trauma patients. Well, most of them are supposed to be retrieved within five to ten days. Some of them. You go as long as 30, but the longer you leave them in, the more difficult they are to get out. When we thought that this was going to be for high-risk patients, we were going to be a great thing to do. But it turns out that when when we when we got these uh, removable filters, there was a three-fold increase in the use of filters across the country. And one study that was done at our uh, national group of over 400 patients, only 22% of them were actually ever retrieved. And it was estimated that you'd have to spend $100,000 uh, to prevent one uh, PE uh, with a filter. So um, needless to say, these, uh, these sort of have fallen out of favor in most places. All right, now I really can't advance these slides. Can I have a little technical help here? There's another way, can I, let me try this. Oh yeah, okay, I'll use this, Never mind. Okay, so g going back, um, we, present, we decided to go back and look again uh, a few years later on a, at a 10-year uh, anniversary of our first time, and we went back to look at the NTDB again to see if things had changed uh, after our first presentation. And um, just to remember that uh, pulmonary emboli after injury is really not a, n a new finding. In fact, this guy was a uh, pathologist at the <coughs> University of uh, Minnesota and recognized that that patients who had fractures actually often died of pulmonary embolism. And in those days, you would recognize PE because people died. Um, nowadays, we, you know, we see a person who gets a little hypoxic, um, we <coughs> get a little tachycardic, and we go right to CT scan, and we're finding them more and more, right? So, um, if, you know, PEs and DVTs are, are really supposed to be preventable or potentially preventable. You can be fined if you, by, uh, by the Medicare and Medi-Cal, if you have a high rate of DVT in your hospital. And if you're a surveillance place, like, like what we are when we go around and look for these things all the time, your rate's going to be five times higher than somebody who doesn't survey. Um, so we have to be careful there. And um, now we look at any unexplained drop in, P in uh, in uh, oxygenation, we go right to multi-detector CT scan, and we are finding clot in a lot of places that we didn't know of before. So they're often an incidental finding, or you send your patient to CT for something else, and you find a clot in the iliac vein that you didn't know about. So we're, we're detecting a lot of these before they're actually symptomatic. So we wanted to go through um, a couple years ago and say, what's the current incidence of pulmonary embolism following trauma in the United States? And what is the PE attributable mortality? How many people are dying from it? And so I hypothesized something that, um, I, and I actually was brave enough for, to present this at a national meeting, that maybe PE and DVT are not really the same disease. That maybe there are different risk factors. Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, we've been treating them by, we've been trying to prevent PE by preventing DVT, but is that really, are they really the same? And we also um, thought that maybe the rates were increasing in PE because we're discovering them all the time, but that the mortality hopefully was decreasing. So we went back to the NTDB and looked at centers who had contributed data to the early, t um, early paper that we wrote and to the later paper so that we could compare them all and so that we had a, a, a good historical comparison. Um, and we didn't take anybody who hadn't, who didn't, you know, didn't report any complications. So if your trauma center had no complications, you weren't going to be in my study because I knew you weren't telling me the truth because we all have complications. Um, so when we went back in, we had now about a million patients to look at from 326 trauma centers across the country. Overall mortality and the trauma across the U.S. is really pretty, pretty low. We did find a lot of DVT. 
uh, about 1% of the patients. Um, we had PEs that were a little bit less, but still a half a percent, which is, you know, still pretty significant. And only 20% of the patients with PE had a DVT reported. Again, it goes to my bias that maybe they're not always the same disease. And this is another thing that we thought was interesting. So the risk factors for DVT and PE among this, this group of injured, were, they were actually not the same. So if you had a head injury, you were much more likely to get a DVT or PE or if you've been on the ventilator more than three days. Um, but if you had a severe chest injury, you were much more likely to be diagnosed with the pulmonary embolism. And I think I can tell you why I think this is, this is true. So how about IVC filters? Well, they were still being used. About 2% of all the people in the NTDB were still getting an IVC filter. Almost all of them were put in as prophylaxis. Um, there were center clustering, some centers like ours, uh, hardly ever put filters in, and there are other centers where 10% of their trauma patients are getting a filter. What about the PE rate compared to before? Well, you can see here that the PE rate um, when historical was 0.21, and in the current time, it's actually doubled. But the mortality has halved. So are we just discovering a lot of PE that are not very significant? So. It's possible that the true incidence of pulmonary embolism is actually increasing. It's, all, it's also possible that we just had better reporting, people recognizing, putting in their NTDB, being very honest about their complications, or that we were just dealing with sicker people. We could say that. Um, it could be that the VTE prophylaxis that we're using is, is not effective, and I will say that's probably partially true. But actually, I think the real thing is we have a big surveillance bias because we're detecting more of them and reporting them. So we, we boldly suggested that there could be an uncoupling between DVT and PE, that a severely injured patient who was in shock, who had coagulopathy at the beginning, perhaps protein C is depleted, something has happened to that, co that coagulation system, and they quickly develop a hypercoagulable state. And, and when you have a hypercoagulable state, if you have a TBI, you're likely to have stasis, as I reported before. If you're fractured, you have a venous injury, and you might get a DVT. But if you have a chest injury, there's inflammation in your chest, and you have these things called PE. And when I presented this, somebody in the audience stood up and said, are you sure it's not PT? I said, what do you mean? It's just thrombite. And actually, if you look at um, some shock models, which I know you have in your, uh, in your research laboratory, and you, and you bleed an animal out, and later on you look at their lungs, they all have clot in their lungs. So shock, transfusions, they have clot, thrombi, not necessarily embolic. Well, and again, about the PE rate and the filter rate, historical, so I would say the, the, you know, the prophylactic filters are not really working because um, you know, the, they were still being put in, but the PE rate was still high. So we concluded that PE was being increasingly recognized after injury, that it ha but the attributed mortality and, and our ability to rescue people has gotten better. <coughs> PE may be PT, a de, a de novo clot, uh, and, and it's associated with chest trauma and is probably not prevented by filters. So this is the old triangle that we, did, that we submitted before. And then I said, well, let's, let's revise this. Maybe it's really a square. And down here under inflammation uh, with chest trauma is where we're seeing some of these uh, pulmonary emboli. Um, Dr. Jerkovic and I are part of the National Trauma Institute, uh, which has funded a, a, a series of research grants over the years, and because this group that we work with has ties to the Department of Defense, we've been able to actually secure some funding. So um, this is, so CLOT is a group of leaders in post-traumatic thromboembolism. Uh, there are 17 of us who sit at tables like this every time we go to meetings and we talk about, you know, what can we do about PE and DBT, and we, we think that we were, we're the sort of the experts. 
And it's interesting because we did a survey among ourselves and found out that none of us practiced the same way. You know, <laughs> so the variance was the norm is the paper we wrote, even those of us that think we're experts because we didn't have the data. Um, and the second time when we, we published is that, you know, there's, there's a surveillance bias. Um, if you go around and, and scan your patients, you're going to have DVT five times more than somebody who doesn't. So those were the ones that we, that we published without any funding. So finally, finally, we were able to get um, money from the Department of Defense. And this is what we're looking at now. The first hypothesis is that these small peripheral pulmonary clots that you discover incidentally on CT scans are not embolic and perhaps do not need any treatment. And this is very important for the military surgeons who are uh, here in the room, because when the patients were evacuated out of Iraq and Afghanistan and they came through Germany, we put them in the CT scanners and they almost all of them had some clot and they were not symptomatic and they were subsegmental. And the question is, do you anticoagulate a patient like that and put them on the airplane to come back to the States? And, the, you know, so the military surgeons were really concerned about these little things that we were seeing on CT. Um, we hypothesized also that the risk factors for pulmonary thrombi are going to be different than those from pulmonary emboli because, once again, I believe they are two different diseases. And then we have this thing called fibrinogen, fibrinolytic shutdown. And, and let me explain um, what that is. So I'm going to, first of all, show you the military data, which is really pretty uh, interesting. So if you do selective surveillance, you find um, that the DVT rates are about 6% and the PE rates among the injured um, uh, combatants was about 1.4%. But if you scan everybody, you can see that uh, almost 5% of, uh, of the severely injured patients that came through Germany had, had a, a PE or a, or a PT put it that way. And the other thing that uh, is really scary, I don't know how much TXA you're using uh, in your hospital, but TXA will really accelerate your VTE rate. We've had some massive pulmonary emboli very early on at, at San Francisco General when we were using TXA a little bit more liberally. So now we're not using it unless they actually have fibrinolysis uh, by TAG analysis. So, it turns out that I'm sure you're using some type of uh, thromboelastography in your resuscitation. You, I mean, we use the Sonoplot, um, but we also have some TEG machines. And it turns out that there are patients on the spectrum. So the spectrum is a mo you know, many patients, most patients hopefully are physiologic. So you're clotting and unclotting at, at physiologic rates that, that protect you. If you lice clot, the red bar there, if you lice it um, when you're coming in after trauma, you're much more likely to die, right? Because your blood is not clotting. So they have a very high uh, mortality rate. But there's also these people that have this thing called shutdown. In other words, they don't lice clot. They form clot, but it doesn't go away. And so if you think about all the time that we've been thinking about how do you prevent DVT, how do you prevent pulmonary embolism, we've been looking at the side of the equation of making clot. We haven't really thought about the side of the equation that the clot, where clot doesn't break down. And so if you have a patient who has this lysis that's low, and um, these are patients who, who we are targeting now with something that break, helps them break clot down. And can you think of it, those of you that are new interns maybe, the, the, a single drug that would do this? Can you think about what makes a clot strong? What are the things that go into a clot? Fibrin is one, and there's one more, a platelet, right? So antiplatelet agents, and I have to say that orthopedic surgeons really came onto this way before us, because they give their patients aspirin. So if you have a person who is in this lysis shutdown phase, perhaps they sh we should be targeting them with aspirin. So this is the basis of our research. Give me two years and I'll tell you uh, if, it's, if it works. Um, but we're actually drawing blood, doing some very important an interesting tag and analysis using TPA to actually tell us where we are in this lytic syndrome and then targeting patients uh, for aspirin or antiplatelet therapy. Um, so 30 years, maybe we're getting close, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's nice to be um, able to share this with you. Uh, as I said, there's 
I have great respect for your, your, your program. And the first time I came here to interview, I think when I was interviewing for medical school, or maybe it was all of UC Davis was in trailers. I mean, the faculty had, were in trailers. It wasn't even really built. There was a single hospital here, so you've really come a long way. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. campus. Um, it's great to, to be here to share with you. Um, and this is, whoops, this is what I'm doing after I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. That was yeah. just great. And I really think it's a great example of what you can do with a career. So I'm looking at my chiefs who are about to move into the next phase of their life. When you make observations and you stay focused on a question, you know, the, if you look back on, unlike the two years you spend in the lab where you really like, got to get it all done right now, you've got the time to ask the questions and really um, make a difference in terms of understanding what's going on in disease. And not all the problems are solved. You heard from Eminem, we've still got, we've got a few, you know, people doing operations on Corona kids. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but in any event, we've got a few times, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, and I think they're about both thromboembolism as well as, you know, how do you develop a career that uh, uh, is so rewarding. So we've got some time. Questions for Dr. Ian. Ian. I just want to say, first of all, this really paradigm shifting work. Obviously, we have using that as something to build on here. And so uh, thank you for your kind I'm curious a little bit about the uh, elevated PTT. Is that just like a surrogate marker of an early consumptive? Well, I think, you know, that's why I said to remember that, because I think those people, what we're seeing when you when you serially look at thromboelastography <coughs> is the sicker people come in anticoagulated and they rapidly develop that hypercoagulable state. So that observation that we made, you know, many years ago is actually true. And so when we take their blood and, and put them in the TEG machine, you know, early on, many of them are, are um, already lysing clot. And then because their clotting system's off, then they become hypercoagulable or they use up their factors um, that break down clot. So it's... It's it, normalizing the PTT early on is dangerous or beneficial. Yeah, who knows, right? I mean, maybe uh, when I first saw that, I said, oh, maybe we just gave them too much fresh frozen plasma. And that's the other thing, is you, as you probably know, around the country, some people are, are giving fresh frozen plasma in the field now. Um, so is that the right thing to do? I, I don't know. Anything, anytime you get a procoagulant, you're going to pay a price at the other side. That's great. Hi, hey, Peggy, wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking, is there any data on the difference in the morphology of the clot that you see early in a lung versus you see late in a lung? Nope. I have no idea. Dr. Brown, that's an assignment for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't no read anything, but I, I, I'm not quite sure how you'd get one of those clots from, uh, I mean, as you know, you do a CT scan on day one on a trauma patient, it's at 10, 15% of them have some clot that sits in their lung. Right. If you were able to pull that clot out, does that look like the same piece of tissue that a clot that occurs in a head injury patient been laying in bed three weeks later that has a in, an an toxic event? An embolic versus yeah. the thrum. I don't know. Um, we're only brave enough to not treat the subsegmental ones. You know, if you right. see it and it's, you know, it's a segmental or certainly, then you, you feel like you have to treat it, right? But these little ones, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, know. I don't think anybody knows. That's a, an animal experiment that somebody needs to do. Ours, the ones that we have, that picture I showed you, those are little mice models that were um, for shock, but we haven't thought about that. Dr. Lisa Brown, Dr. Pollard. See, I have friends in the audience. I, at least three or four of my res former <laughs> residents are here, my former medical student. This is like great. I love it. And we think of UCSF as a great training ground for UCSF. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great talk. Thanks. Um, question about, and this is really interesting work, and I think that that they always say the more you look for it, the more you're gonna find, right? And then are they gonna be relevant? We talked about that, but so you know, PE and DVT is one of the PSIs for the HRQ, right? So how do, how does how does that how does that play out in terms of you know centers want to take the best care of their patients and find these and treat the clinically relevant ones, but yet you don't want to get dinged? Yeah. No. One of our one of our colleagues that's on on the clock grant. Um, their hospital was fined a couple million dollars because they survey 
for, um, you know, for they, they run their ultrasound machine all over their trauma patients every week, and their DVT rate's five times higher than somebody who never looks. So we just have to point out to them that this is, you know, there is a surveillance bias, and you can't, uh, but, but they got fined until they had to go and show, you know, what they were doing with their trauma patients. And it wasn't for research purposes. It was like, this is the way they take care of patients. We don't do that as a routine in our hospital, um, but we are doing it for the patients that are in the study. Tina, hi. Tina, hi. Uh, Tina Hall, thank you. Uh, you know, when I was looking at your, your database research and your two comparisons, and I was thinking, well, what is different between those two time periods? I mean, uh, you know, TSA is obviously one of them, but the other is massive transfusion protocol. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to tease out if the massive transfusion protocol is having some other effects that we really don't have. So um, the 17 centers that are participating in, in my research, which is all prospective, we have a data, each data sheet is about 12 pages long. And even though we sold this to the Department of Defense as we're going to do this, we are going to have, be able to answer any question because we, have, we project there'll be about 8,000 patients a year that are going into this. And it's, it's in, for those of you that are doing re clinical research, it's, it's in REDCap, um, which is the you know, way you can, part, and we have, with branching logic in there, we are going to have so much information and the, and the number of units transfused, TXA, fibrinogen, um, platelets, everything that's been given to that patient, we're, gonna, we're collecting all that data. So we are going to have a very rich database, which is prospective and is actually made to look at this problem as opposed to things that are collected for some other reason. But yes, we're looking at every piece of the multi -transfusion, uh, multiple transfusions, as well as anything that the patient's gotten in terms of what were they on before they came to the hospital, um, all of their risk factors. Unfortunately, when you do research for the Department of Defense, as I found out though, you can only enroll people who are combat so there's a certain age range, um, you can 18 to 40, just so you know. So we won't have a lot of information about a little bit older patients, but certainly the, you know, the young trauma patients are studying actively. Chris Jackson, Dr. Parker. Oh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, how do you balance between TBT prophylaxis and the acute head injury patients? So it used to be we were like begging, you know, every day, please can we start it? Um, but we were able to show them that they their patients are hypercoagulable very early. So we we can do it at 48 hours, even in a patient with a head bleed. Um, yeah, it, it, it took a while to get there, but data helps, you know, and when they when they saw that. And actually the PE rates in um, head injured patients really high across the country. Really high because of people have been withholding prophylaxis. Chris, great talk. Um, has anybody looked at syndactyl models in the different hypercoagulability fibrin shutdown? Because since that's kind of a yeah. way of looking at the glycocalyx. Yeah, I don't know exactly what um, what what Gene Moore's doing in there, but we are saving plasma to be sent. Uh, to Denver, where we're starting to look at a whole bunch of those things. Uh, the five centers that are doing this, the tag work are Portland, uh, Denver, Houston, um, ourselves, and, um, and Shop Trauma. So th there'll be a lot of information coming out on the basic science side. All right, thank Great. you, and congratulations on all of you who are just starting your careers. I hope it's rewarding. It's a great field to be in. Thank you again, Peggy, for a great